Truth is often the first casualty of self-interest. In the realm of advertising, we can see this plainly. The company that sells an anti-aging cream, for example, uses fear and insecurity to drive demand for its products. They imply your beauty is measured by the elasticity of your skin, not the virtue of your soul. Or things like, no one will find you attractive if you don't look young. This is a shallow exploitation of insecurity. Clearly, what is really being sold is a definition of beauty that doesn't require the challenging task of achieving and maintaining virtue. In the short run, it's far easier to rub overpriced cream on your face than it is to start down the path of genuine wisdom and integrity. In this way, we can see that the self-interest of the advertiser and the consumer are both being served in the exchange at the expense of the truth. We know that we will all become old and ugly, and also that this fate need not rob us of love, but rather we can receive and give more love in our old age than we even could in our youth if we live with virtue, compassion, and generosity. But the truth is, there's far less money to be made in philosophy than there is in vanity, which is another way of saying that people will pay good money to avoid the demands of virtue. And so the mutual exploitation of shallow avoidance is a cornerstone of any modern economy. In the same way, being told that anarchism is just plain bad helps us avoid the anxiety and ambivalence we feel about that which we both fear and love at the same time. Our educational and political leaders sell us relief from ambivalence and uncomfortable exploration, inevitably at the expense of truth. And so far, most people have been relatively eager customers. The CEOs of large companies receive enormous salaries for their services. Let's just imagine a scenario wherein a small number of new companies grow despite having no senior managers and appear to be making above average profits in the process. In this scenario, when business leadership is actually revealed as potentially counterproductive to profitability, or at least unrelated to profitability, it's easy to see that the self-interest of business leaders is immediately and perhaps permanently threatened. In addition, picture all the other groups and people whose interests would be harmed in such a scenario. Business schools would see their enrollment numbers drop precipitously. The lawyers, accountants, and decorators who serve these business leaders would see the demand for their services dropping. The private schools that cater to the families of the rich would be hard hit, at least for a time. Elite magazines, business shows, conventions, life coaches, tailors, and all other sorts of people would feel the sting of the transition. And that's just to put it mildly. We can easily imagine that the first few companies to see increased profitability as a result of ditching their senior managers would be roundly condemned and mocked by the entrenched managers in similar companies. These companies would quickly be accused of cooking the books, of exploiting a mere statistical anomaly or fluke, of having secret managers, of producing shoddy goods, of stuffing the pipe with premature sales, of actually running at a loss, and a whole host of other excuses. The imminent demise of these companies that ditch their CEOs would be gleefully predicted by most, if not all, self-interested onlookers. The CEOs of existing companies would avoid doing business with them and would doubtless combine a patronizing benevolence. Like, yeah, you do see these trends emerge every once in a few years. They bubble up, falter, and die out, and investors end up poorer but wiser along with fairly open fear-mongering like, I'm not sure that it's a good career move to work at these sorts of companies without CEOs. I would consider it a rather black mark on the resume of any job seeker and a plethora of other excuses. Should these new companies without CEOs continue to grow, 
Doubtless, the existing business executives would get in touch with their political friends seeking for a political solution on behalf of the customers they wish to protect. Entrenched groups will always move to protect their own self-interest. And this isn't a bad thing. It's simply a fact of human nature. So it's important to understand that what is called unproductive, negative, extreme, or dangerous may indeed be just that. But it's always worth looking at the motives of those who invest the time and energy to create and propagate such labels. Why are they so interested? Who benefits? Shouldn't we follow the money? We can also find examples of this phenomenon of the robber barons in late 19th century America. The story goes that these amoral predatory monopolists were fleecing a helpless public, and so they had to be restrained through the force of government anti-monopoly legislation. Now, if this story were really true, the first thing that we would expect is a one-two punch of evidence showing how prices were rising where these monopolies flourished and also that it was these helpless and enraged customers who thumped the ears of their legislators and demanded protection from the monopolists. Of course, it would be purely absurd to imagine that this was the case, and it turns out to be a complete falsehood. If an unjust price increase of, say, 10% or 20% were imposed on ground beef, the net loss to the average consumer would be no more than a few pennies per week. So it's incomprehensible to imagine any customer or group of customers combining their time and effort to pursue complex and lengthy legislation for the sake of opposing a tiny price increase. The cost-benefit ratio would be absurdly out of balance, since it would doubtless cost most of these customers far more in time and money to pursue such action than they could conceivably save by reducing such an unjust price increase. For example, are you pursuing legal action against Exxon for higher gas prices? No, you're not. Why? Because it's not worth your time. So to find the real culprits, we gotta first look at any group which can justify the pursuit of such complex and uncertain legislation the purchasing of legislators, the writing of articles, and other efforts spent to influence the media, the desperate pursuit of a highly risky venture. Who could possibly justify such a bad investment? And who could stand to substantially benefit? The answer is obvious and contains all the information we need to know to disprove the claims put forward. The groups most harmed by these supposed monopolists were, of course, their direct competitors. So we would expect the primary sponsors of this legislation would not be the outraged customers, but rather the companies competing with these robber barons. Clearly, if these monopolists were unjustly increasing prices, this would be an endless invitation for these competitors or even outside entrepreneurs to undercut their prices. But perhaps these robber barons were achieving their monopolies through preferential political favors, like forcibly keeping competitors from entering the market. Well, we know for certain that this could not be the case. If these robber barons actually did own the legislature, then their competitors would be highly unlikely to take the step of attempting to influence the legislature because they would know it was a fight they couldn't win. If these monopolists were gaining massive and unjust profits through political favors, then their competitors who were shut out of such a lucrative system would be completely unable to funnel as much money to the legislators. Not only that, those making the laws would be exposed to blackmail for past deals if they switch sides, so to speak. So without examining a single historical fact, we can very easily determine what actually happened, which was that A, the monopolists were not actually raising prices but were lowering them, which we know because their competitors did not take the economic route of undercutting on the price, but rather the political route of using the force of the state to cripple these monopolists. B, 
B, the monopolists were not gaining market share or unjust profits through political means because the legislatures were still available for sale. And C, the consumers were entirely happy with the existing arrangement, which we know because the competitors had nothing to offer that the consumers would prefer to the existing state of things. This hypothesis is amply borne out by the accurate historical evidence. Where these, quote, robber barons dominated the market, the prices of the goods they produced went down, sometimes considerably. In the case of using refrigerated rail cars to store meat, a price drop of 30% was achieved in the span of a few months. Clearly, this did not harm the interests of the customer but it did harm the self-interest of those attempting to compete with these highly efficient businesses. Sadly, these competitors preferred to take the political route of attacking their successful rivals through the power of the state rather than attempting to innovate themselves in turn and compete more successfully in the free market. Well, what about the argument that the robber barons used violence to create their monopolies by threatening or killing competing workers? Even if we accept this argument is true, it serves the anarchist argument far more than the statist position. If you hire a security guard who continually fell asleep on the job and permitted the facility he guarded to be robbed over and over again, year after year, what would your reaction be? Would you wake him up and promote him to the rank of global manager of a highly complex security company? Would his rank incompetence at a simple task make him your ideal candidate for an enormous complex job? Of course not. If a government is so amoral and incompetent that it permits the murder of innocent citizens by the robber barons, then clearly it cannot conceivably be competent and moral enough to protect citizens from the complex economic predations of the same robber barons. A group that cannot perform a simple function cannot conceivably perform a far more complex function. Over a hundred years later, we can still see how effective this propaganda really is. The specters of these robber barons still inhabit the imaginary haunted houses of our history. The role of government in controlling exploitive monopolies remains unquestioned. And how many people know the basic facts of the situation? Principally, that it was not the consumers who opposed these companies, but their competitors. When we look at political solutions to pressing problems, we see the same pattern over and over again. Government-run education was not instituted because parents were dissatisfied with private schools or because children were not educated or anything like that but rather because the teachers wanted the job security. And cultural and religious busybodies wanted to get their hands on the tender minds of children. The New Deal in the 1930s was not instituted because the free market made people poor, but rather because government mismanagement of the money system destroyed almost a quarter of the wealth of the United States. Time and again, we see that it's not freedom that leads to political control and an increase in state violence. It's statism that leads to the increase in political control and state violence. The government doesn't expand its control because freedom doesn't work. It's the opposite. Freedom doesn't work because the government expands its control. So we can see that freedom or voluntarism or anarchy does not create problems that governments are required to solve. Rather, propagandists lie about what the government is actually up to. Protecting customers really means using violence to protect the profits of inefficient businesses. And the resulting expansions of political coercion and control breeds even more problems, which are always ascribed to freedom. This is part three of the What is Anarchy series. If you missed the first two installments, the links will be in the description for you. If you want to see me produce a part four, let me know in the comments section. Be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, give this video a like, and share it with everybody you know. 
Also subscribe to my email list through my website, highimpactflix.com. That's highimpactflix.com. If you want to support this work, those links are also in the description, or you can become a channel member and grab a hard-hitting conversation starting design that you can put on a shirt, hoodie, mug, cell phone case, whatever you want. Remember, freedom is dangerous. The only thing more dangerous is not having it. I'll see you in the next video.